Um, so your, uh, the, the one problem from Prop Set 4 is due today. <coughs> but there won't be another problem set assigned uh, today or next week because we have exam coming up. And uh, um, so that exam again is going to be in the evening. I'll bring snacks um, um, from 5.30 to 7 p.m. in uh, room 190, okay? And again, that's going to cover the material through lecture 7 notes, which we'll complete today, and uh, through these problem sets, okay? And so we'll have a little, I'll uh, be available to uh, discuss your questions at, at our usual problem session uh, for at least 45 minutes. We'll have a little review. Okay? I won't come with anything to be prepared. It's really just about addressing questions that you have. Um, Gopi uh, has problem set two graded, so I will look at it and I'll put it in the front office for you to pick up. Um, I'll, I'll let you know when that's available, and we'll have the next two problem sets. This is just one problem graded uh, as soon as possible. Okay. All right. Um, by the way, so the, the exam is going to be closed book. All right, uh, and um, uh, there's not a lot of formulas. Remember, it's more conceptual, all right? So uh, just keep that in mind. All right. Very good. So last time uh, we had established the fundamental properties of states in quantum mechanics. A state in quantum mechanics, the most general state in quantum mechanics, is described by a density operator. And we typically call that rho. Um, and this operator has some basic properties. It's a Hermitian operator. It's also a positive operator. And uh, we, by convention, normalize it so that it's easy to calculate probability. Uh, we can always renormalize afterwards if, we, if that wasn't the case. So this is not a fundamental property. It's a property that we impose in order to easily calculate probabilities. And because it's Hermitian operator, we can diagonalize it. And it has a decomposition in terms of its eigenvectors and eigenvalues. These eigenvalues are all uh, non-negative numbers because this is a positive operator. Okay? So we can always think about the density operator as a statistical mixture of its eigenvectors weighted by its eigenvalues. But as we noted, we should be a little bit careful. The, we can think about the density operator in an infinite number of ways. If it's general for a general mixed state, there are a uh, uncountably infinite number of different statistical mixtures, all of which give the same density operator. There's a unique spectral decomposition up to degeneracies, but as we saw in the homework we saw last time, uh, we can mix together different pure states and get the same state. Which is to say, if we do measurements, our predictions are exactly the same. We couldn't tell the difference as far as the measurements we would make. That's what it means to say this state is the same. Um, of course, if it's a pure state, then there is a unique density operator. Because there's only one thing in that. Uh, there's only one term in this decomposition. Right. Um, now, we talked about a way of determining whether the state was pure or mixed by looking at something we call the purity of the state. The purity of the state is uh, assuming we have a normalized state given by the trace of rho squared. 
And so if it's a pure state, this purity is one. And if it's a completely mixed state, then it has the minimal value of one over the dimension of the Hilbert space. And in that case, the density operator is just proportional to the identity. And it looks the same in all bases. For a pure state, it's just a single projector. Okay? Uh, one concept we didn't introduce, but I just want to mention another way we can think about the degree of mixedness of the state is thinking about entropy. Now, you learned about entropy in the context of statistical physics or thermodynamics, but entropy is a, a somewhat more general concept from information theory. And you can think about entropy as the information that I'm lacking about the state of the system. So when something has zero entropy, I'm not missing any, any information whatsoever. I have a perfect description. It's perfect. There's no randomness. Okay, there's no missing information. So a state with zero entropy is a pure state. A state that has more entropy is mixed because I'm missing information. Yeah. What base is the logarithm? Well, your choice. So that's a good. I, I, I actually um, uh, by um, by how shall I say? It? I purposefully didn't put the base here because it depends. You you have your choice what you want to do. If you write this in base 2, then you're measuring the entropy in bits. If you write it in a uh, natural logarithm with base E, then there's something called nats. Nat. Uh, so it's up to you how you want to what base. It's just like a convention that you decide how you want to measure the entropy. So if this was a two-state system, that is to say, if it was a dimension 2 Hilbert space, uh, and we measure this base 2, then the maximum entropy is 1 bit, which means I don't know whether it's up or down. Yeah, you had a question. Um, well, this, this has really more to do with stat max. Uh -huh. do, you, do you need to multiply it against some sort of constant to... Right, so if we, if we want to measure it in energy units, or, I mean, Boltzmann's constant, is a way of relating uh, the entropy to, in some sense, energy, right? Because the open constant times time. That's, that's a convention. But we don't need to do that. We can write it if this is dimension less. So in some sense, this is a counting argument. Okay. So it's a, another way to think that I want you to just keep in mind that Pure states, again, are states where we have maximum possible information. Those states have zero entropy. A state that's mixed has, we're missing information about the state of the system, that, then it has finite entropy. Okay. All right. Now, we, at the end of lecture last time, talked a little bit about dynamics. And in particular, what we talked about was closed system dynamics. So if we have a closed quantum system and all degrees of freedom are accounted for, then as we've argued before, that evolution must be uh, um, unitary. Okay? And if I say have the state, I know what the state of the system is, I define, or at least this is the state I've assigned based on my information at time t equals zero, then the state at a later time is given by this unitary transformation on the state, as we showed last lecture. Okay? And uh, that kind of evolution is something which preserves the purity of the, the system. That is to say, as we calculated last time, the trace of the, of the uh, row squared at the later time, at any later time, is the same as what it was at the initial time. It's unchanged. It's conserved with time. Okay? 
Equivalently, we could say that the entropy is preserved. Right? Because the eigenvalues are the same at all times. So this is a point that I, I want to just mention. It's a point of linear algebra that we didn't state before, is that unitary transformations preserve the eigenvalues of an operator or matrix. Is that obvious? What I mean by that is, let's say I have an operator A, and I do a unitary transformation on it. I could put it in the U or U dagger on either side. It doesn't matter. Uh, let's say I do it like that. And let's call this B. What I claim is that both if A, so let's say A is a permission operator, so is B then, right? And what I claim is that the eigenvalues of this operator are the same as the eigenvalues of this. How would you prove that? Let's see. Anyone have an idea? What do you say? Um, look at the determinant of E minus lambda i. So then on the right hand side, rewrite i as u, u dagger, and factor them out and rewrite it as a lambda i. You could do that. That would definitely work. We could look at the determinant, and that will work. I'll show you a, quick, a very quick and dirty way to do it. Let's just say that a is got a spectral decomposition. Right? Then what is b? These are a new set of vectors, but it's the same eigenvalues. Okay, so it's just a quick and dirty way of proving that. So if you do a unitary transformation, you don't change the eigenvalues. And if you don't change the eigenvalues, you don't change the entropy, you don't change the purity. <coughs> the degree of mixedness is the same. All right. I'm going to scoot by here, so we'll go ahead. Thank you. Um, so, throughout, we've talked about, uh, in discussing dynamics, we've restricted our attention to closed systems. Okay? And that, in a closed system, what we're imagining is that we have um, a description of every degree of freedom in the system, and we can track it. So closed system dynamics every degree of freedom is accounted for. And as we discussed, there are three quantum mechanics that has to be described as by a unitary transformation. But maybe in certain circumstances, we don't, or it's essentially impossible to account for every single degree of freedom in the system. That's particularly true as systems become more and more macroscopic. It becomes more and more difficult to do that. Um, so, and in fact, we're familiar with that uh, in classical physics. We, for example, when we talk about thermodynamics, which is typically applied to looking at physical systems in the macroscopic world, we imagine the system of interest might be in contact with, for example, a thermal reservoir. Right? 
or sometimes we call it the bath, right? Because we used to think about it as some, you know, liquid that you immerse things in. And this thermal reservoir might be at some temperature T. And then the system is exchanging, say, energy with the reservoir. <coughs> and typically, we imagine that at some point later, this comes to equilibrium. Thermal equilibrium, for example. Now, thermal equilibrium is this kind of steady state evolution is not really, I mean, it's an irreversible process, typically. And it's not consistent with the microscopic laws of classical dynamics. The microscopic laws of classical dynamics are time reversible. But I think when you know, kind of shatter the chalk at least once a lecture, that's a pretty irreversible thing. Now, it's only, we say, effectively irreversible, all intents and purposes irreversible, because of the macroscopic nature of the environment. That's another word for this. Um, so the reason that things are irreversible in some sense, we imagine at least one way of um, having irreversibility as an emergent property from fundamentally reversible dynamics is if we kind of coarse grain and say that there is sort of, you know, there's the fine grain microscopic degrees of freedom, but on, within some coarse graining of the degrees of freedom, things are lost and they're just sort of there so long, they, they never come back. And this is, of course, a deep problem. It's a complicated problem. How is there an arrow of time really? More fundamentally, is there, are there things that are fundamentally irreversible, like black holes? Or is information lost behind a black hole? There's, of course, very deep and fundamental questions. However, putting those aside, we could say that we could, even without getting that, that deep about it, um, that we can get irreversible dynamics effectively from fundamental reversible dynamics in the macroscopic way. And for example, one of the things that could happen in this kind of thermodynamics is, for example, this might come to equilibrium, so I might have had a, something which, say, uh, once it got in contact with the heat bath, its entropy increased, for example, right? Uh, that's a problem I'm sure you, you solved in thermodynamics. So, um, the entropy of the system isn't conserved in this case. It would be if I had perfectly reversible dynamics, I would cheat, not change in any way what information I had about the system if it was all perfectly I looked at every molecule and can follow every one of those trajectories. But if I lose track of it, I lose track of information, entropy increases. Okay. So that's classical. And the same thing would be true for quantum open system dynamics. So whereas in, if we take account of every degree of freedom that describes the state of our system, that is described by a unitary evolution 
if my quantum system is in contact with the environment, I can call it the reservoir, the bath, but my quantum system, whatever this is, could be an atom, could be a molecule, it could be a superconducting circuit. And there's, it's in contact in some way with something we'll call the environment, but it's a quantum environment. All the degrees of freedom of the environment are themselves also described by quantum mechanics. Then I can get effectively irreversible dynamics here too. In the same way that I had it in classical thermodynamics. And this is not unitary. Because information about my quantum system is being lost to the environment. It ain't coming back. Because it got lost in this macroscopic number of degrees of freedom that I call the quantum environment. So I could get a situation where, you know, my quantum system comes to thermal equilibrium. Like the spins out of the oven, the silver atoms out of the oven in the original Sir Gerlach Gedanken experiment that we discussed. I mean what's going on is the spin is the, the, the silver atom is bouncing around, hitting, they're colliding with other atoms, and it's depolarizing the atoms, and it's totally random. And I lose information about whether it's been up or spin down to the collision information that's stored in the other atoms, which provide an environment for any one atom. Or the walls of the uh, oven itself, which interact through collisions, for example. Okay, So I can get an increase in entropy. I can get a decrease in entropy. That's called cooling, right? I can change the entropy of the system. So if it's non-unitary dynamics, do not conserve purity or entropy. Entropy, I could heat, entropy increases. I can cool, entropy decreases. Of course, the entropy of the environment increases. And of course, this is one of the ways that you prepare a pure state, or try to. This is by taking a state, you know, some sort of state, and then getting it towards, this would be the ultimate in entropy decrease. So now you can't do that perfectly. That would violate uh, the third law of thermodynamics. But you can get as close as you possibly can by improving the refrigeration. Yeah. Is it possible to have a uh, physical quantum close to the system dynamic? Because if you decrease entropy in the closed system, the entropy outside system must increase to, to keep it balanced, right? Right. So you, I mean, if you have it, if it's completely closed, then entropy is conserved because then it's unitary. So it's always it's always relative to other degrees of freedom where that entropy is high. Yeah. Um, can you, in theory, say that if we know all the degrees of freedom of the universe, then the entropy would just not be increasing? Because That's right. I mean, if you were able to track everything, both of the system and the environment, then the whole system, the entropy, has remained exactly the same. I mean, that's the same thing true. Again, you know, when I crush the chalk, I've increased the entropy of the chalk 
right? But of course, those that information about how that fracture is stored in all the vibrations of the floor, which ultimately hit the wall and whatnot. And I have to keep track of all of them in order to maintain complete knowledge. But if I say, I'm only going to keep track of these degrees of freedom, and all the rest of the degrees of freedom are effectively lost to me because I either don't want to bother or don't have the ability to keep track of them, then the entropy of this system has increased. The information about that system is lost to what's going on here. Now, there's more in the quantum world than just that about energy exchange and heating and cooling because we know that uh, when we gain information about a quantum system or lose information about a quantum system, our state of knowledge about the quantum system is changed in a very fundamental way. So, coupling the quantum system to an environment affects our state of knowledge about the quantum system in a profound way. For example, if suppose that time t equals zero, I have a pure state. If through the coupling to the environment, I have some later state of system which is now mixed because I've lost information in the environment, for example. If that's the case, then I have lost coherence. In other words, it might be the case that through this coupling to the environment, I might have, for example, let's say for a spin one half system at time t equals zero, we had a pure state, which we said generally has this matrix representation in the basis of spin up and spin down along some axis. That's my pure state. Through the interaction with the environment, I can have, end up with this state. Well, I've lost information about whether it was uh, in a superposition or not. And this is, this process whereby I lose this is called decoherence. Decoherence is a dynamical process completely described within quantum mechanics. I don't need any magic collapse postulate. It's as equivalent in classical mechanics to the approach to equilibrium. I can derive this in a non-equilibrium statistical physics whereby I have some model of the environment, some model of the coupling of the system environment, and some effective coarse graining. That's important. So if I don't coarse grain, then I keep track of every vast detail. And then I never lose coherence. I have to somehow say that that went away effectively. Okay? So decoherence is describable completely by self-consistently within quantum mechanics in the same way that 
uh, the approach to thermal equilibrium is described within the context of classical mechanics. This kind of evolution is non-unitary. Now, there's a few other things I would say about this kind of evolution. There's lots of ways of think how to think about equilibrium. is that the environment measures the system, but doesn't tell us the result. The environment contains information about whether this thing was up or down, but we don't know. If we could dig it out of the environment, then we'd know which one it is, but we, have a, we can't do it because it's buried in these crazy molecules going in all kinds of directions. And since we don't know it, it's as if Alice prepared spin up with this probability, or she prepared spin down with that probability, but didn't tell us. For all intents and purposes, it's the same thing. Okay? So, um, what that means is that the environment prepares a statistical. about decoherence in a related way is that the environment does a random unitary it doesn't tell us but we don't know which one describe that evolution? Well, we would describe that as a following. If it did a particular unitary evolution, let's say the i one, then the evolution on the state is that. Right? But we don't know which one it is. So we have to average this over all the possible weighted by some probability that it did a particular unitary evolution. So this kind of evolution is not unitary, it's a sum of unitary, weighted by these probabilities. In fact, we typically would write this in the following way. but it's not a unitary map. It's a non-unitary map. It's what we call a completely positive map for very technical reasons. But basically it takes a positive operator to a positive operator. Not a completely map, a completely positive map. Or a CP map. Okay. For example, let's 
suppose I have a spin one half particle. Let's say that spin one half particle was initially polarized along the x direction. Okay? So let's come over here. Let's say at time equals zero, it is paired along the x direction. Spin up. Okay. And that state we know is a superposition of spin up and down along z, right? Now, suppose that we have the environment gives a little kick, a random kick to the spin, and kicks its direction by giving a small rotation around the z-axis. Okay, there's some environment that's out there that's just giving it a random kick. And it rotates it about the z-axis by a small angle, some random angle. Okay? So let's say the environment kicks spin and rotates it slightly, or randomly, doesn't even have to be slightly, about the z-axis. Now, what that rotation, action of rotation, we will study that in detail later in the semester, but it's easy to write down. The rotation around the z-axis is defined by a unitary operator. It leaves the up along z and down along z alone. So those are the eigenvectors of this. And the eigenvalues of a unitary operator are phases, right? You remember that. And the phases are if my angle if rotates it rather around, the, uh, around the, say, the z axis by angle phi. So what we'll find is that this is e to the phi over 2, and this is e to the plus i phi over 2. This is the rotation operator rotates around the z-axis by angle phi. So let's apply this to our state. So let's say, so my rotation by angle phi on the state. I'll do it in the density operator. So this is equal to let's write this out. This is a half up up plus a half down down plus a half up down plus a half down up. Plugging in the state. It has diagonal matrix elements and off diagonal matrix elements, right? So, what happens when I apply this operator to this? You guys tell me. What happens to this guy? I put the U diagonal on this guy. What happens to this term when I apply this guy? So let's look at that. U dagger. Pick up the phase. Yeah, you pick up the phase, but then on the other guy, you get the opposite phase, right? 
So it does nothing. Right? And that's true because this is an eigenvector of rotation around z. It doesn't change it. So the diagonal terms stay exactly the same. But what about the octagonal terms? On this guy, you either get an e to the minus i. On this guy, you get the conjugate of an e to the plus i. Those get the same. So this becomes 1 half e to the um, minus i by plus minus. Right? And this guy becomes e to the plus i. Minus plus. The other guys don't, don't change. So written as a matrix, after this, this middle random kick does what? Well, it leaves the diagonal terms the same, but it puts a phase on the octahedral because we've rotated it. You buy that? So, now suppose that I have a random phase. So my actual state at a later time is the average over all phases So I'm going to average this by summing over all the random rotations. What happens to this? I'm going to integrate that over all angles. It's zero. This became a completely mixed state. I started with a completely a maximally pure state, a completely pure state, and I ended up with a maximally mixed state because this state was a statistical mixture of this and 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 this. And all of those states have different phase relationships with respect to one another. And when I statistically average over them, it's as if they have no phase relationship with respect to one another at all. I've randomized the spin. This is what we call dephasing channel, or dephasing, which is another word for decoherence. I've lost the coherence because I lost the phase information about my superposition. All right, so um, decoherence is a phenomenon. It's a phenomenon that we must take into account when we have a quantum system that is coupled to the environment. And quantum systems are always coupled to the environment. Even the vacuum is the environment. Because the vacuum itself is a quantum thing. And an atom that's in an excited state will decay irreversibly. That is coupling to the open quantum system. That is a non-unitary evolution. And that happens because the vacuum itself is the environment. So, last bit about this. Does decoherence solve the measurement problem? Some people would say it does. Wojciech Zurek up in Los Alamos is one of the uh, key figures who's developed this whole idea about decoherence and how important it is in thinking about quantum mechanics. And there's no doubt it is. Some say decoherence is then the answer to the measurement problem, because I went from a quantum superposition state to a state that's a statistical mixture. And that's what we kind of see. We see these random statistical mixtures. So what do you think? Does decoherence have that? You don't need to worry about the wave function anymore. Decoherence is the end of the story. 
Well, what if you hit the new the new Dempsey operator with the rotation again? Well, it wouldn't do anything anymore after I've averaged it out because it does. I mean, the octane elements are now zero before your average. Um, well, then you keep getting random kicks. I mean, it's really the, the averaging here is all about lost information. If we keep that information, so then it's just a rotated spin. Yeah. So I mean. I mean, we're saying we have random kicks as we don't know, and yep. the information is in the environment. Yeah. I mean, so if we kind of knew, we wouldn't sum over all, I mean, we would still have a... Sure, we have a quantum many body state, which has coherence between the thing that did the kicking and the kicky. Uh, so, yeah, there's, it's only, we, we, the rabbit went in the hat here, where I said, we lost information, but I didn't derive that from any fundamental thing. I would say there, so my own, now this is the editorial opinion here, so we'll go into the editorial page, this is not a textbook, is that decoherence is an important ingredient in understanding measurement. One thing it does is it answers the problem, what is a measurement? A measurement, so it answers the question of Bohr, Bohr, as we discussed, and the Copenhagen interpretation invoked the classical world. It said that a device performs a measurement if it's a classical measuring device. But it didn't quantify what devices should count as classical and what devices are just other many body quantum systems that are talking to this little quantum system. What we can say is a device is, does a measurement when effectively the pointer of my meter is classical. And if that pointer doesn't, the different quantum states of the pointer have decohered. In other words, I can, for all intents and purposes, never see quantum interference between the different states of the meter because those off-diagonal degrees of freedom have been lost to the amplifier, to the power source in, on the grid in P and F. For all intents and purposes, I can't see interference, so it's a classical entity. And so if I can't, for if just from an operational point of view, if I never see interference between those different alternatives, they are classical. So it, in my mind, answers that piece of the question. What kinds of devices are classical measuring devices? They are the ones where the states of the meter decohere through the measuring process because they're effectively macroscopic. So Bohr intuited that, I think. Understood that what meant for the matters. What, what, what decoherence doesn't answer is the question, why do I see only one measurement outcome? There's no collapse here. There's still it, no collapse of the wave function where it's one or the other. It's now in this mixed state. And there is no way to get randomness out of a system which are fundamentally reversible and deterministic without putting it in by hand. And you know the, the, the quantum Bayesians say it's the observer. The Copenhagen interpretation says somehow Something random did happen, we just don't know which one it was, and it randomly became this pointer. That's still a mystery, in my view. And it's still something we don't have a self-consistent picture, and we just kind of do a meta. We say something above quantum mechanics, and we just extract it out.
Um, Adrian, you had a question about the density operator or the notation that we didn't get a chance to. Uh, yeah, actually, um, so there, the notation is a sum of, you know, the same. This guy? Yes, yeah, perfect. So it's the sum of the same ket. Yep. Can we write it as a sum of different kets? Uh, no. Okay. So that kind of state, I mean, it's true that if we look at this, come back over here, okay, thank you, uh, that this is a sum over some different kets. But in itself, that sum must collapse to something which is a projector or sum of projectors. So it'd be wrong to write it in. You, there is not a general form. I mean, it's true, we can always write rho in a basis, right? So if I put in a complete set of right, that's a perfectly good representation. So it is a sum, as you say, of different, a bronze kind of different weighted. But that sum must collapse ultimately to this. There is no state of a system which is this phi times psi is not a state. Would it be okay if there's one of the sums of this? As long as the sum ultimately collapses to this, then yes. Because as I said, this is a sum. But this is not a Hermitian operator, mm. right? Mm. Yeah? Um, so it would collapse to that only if you put it in the right basis, though, correct? It would, yes, it, exactly. You wouldn't be able to see it. Like, as you say, this guy doesn't collapse that, because in the z basis, it has off diagonal elements. But in the x basis, it doesn't. It's hard to tell. By the basis, it's better to think about it from basis independent indicators. Like, is it her mission? Is it uh, a positive operator? Which, if you look at the expectation value, the expectation should always be positive. You can't always look at the sum and see it. All right. So, to conclude this, I want to say, let's, we have talked about, for weeks now, the postulates of quantum mechanics. And we started with the Copenhagen interpretation, and we kind of modernized Copenhagen. So I want to state for you what I would consider to be the modern postulates of quantum mechanics, which are, unfortunately, not written in your standard textbooks on quantum mechanics because they're old. Uh, so, I'll, I'll write them in sort of two, you know, so I'll write them with. in the Copenhagen way and modern. with probability 
PA given by the square of the amplitude where A is an eigenvector of observable A. What I would say is a measurement is described by a POVM, which is a set of positive operators which sum to the identity such that the probability of outcome mu is the trace of rho to be mu. These are generalizations of these. And then we have one final thing is about dynamics. General dynamics of the state closed system that's Copenhagen modern we'd say the closed system rho t evolves according to unitary transformation. And finally, uh, generally, a CT map, which is that rho of t is given by a sum of Krauss operators acting on the state conjugate where they're not unitary. And post-measurement state. If we find A state is given by a particular Krauss operator given, associated with that operator acting on the state remobilized. You now know all of my mechanics, pretty much. say something about multiple degrees of freedom and, and potential products, but we'll get to that. Now, I note that the modern thing that I broke down is the void of physics. It says nothing about the physical world. It doesn't say anything about permission operators. It doesn't say anything about observables. Where the heck is the physics? This is physics, for God's sakes. Well, what it's saying is that this framework here is a kind of information theoretic framework. And it's a framework that has developed in quantum information science, which is my subject of, of interest and, and research. But it, it's 
tells me that there are parts of quantum mechanics that in some sense are about information theory, that aren't really even about physics, just about how we know things about the world and how we make predictions about the world, not about the nature of the world as the physical world as it is. And we want to now, finally, one month and a day after, say, how does this stuff connect to physics? And that's what we're going to begin now. So how do we hook this information theoretic foundation onto the physical world? The way we're going to do that is through something called Noether's theory. Now, Noether, I mean, Noether was a physicist in about 100 years ago, who was studying at that time classical mechanics. But the Noether's theorem is very profound and important. And what Noether's theorem tells us is the following that to Every physical symmetry is associated a conserved physical quantity. So this is an intimate relationship between symmetries and conservation laws. This is something that could be derived from the Ramji mechanics. You guys derive that in your classical mechanics? You ever see that? You might have seen some parts of it. Um, and then there's a connection here to, the, to mathematics, which is that symmetries the set of or symmetry transformations are groups. And in particular, what we're actually, what I should have said, physical continuous symmetry is important when talking about uh, a, a, a group of objects which are continuous, these are the Z groups, that the conserved quantities are the generators of the group. Let me explain what all this means. examples of conserved quantities. Conserved in nature because the universe has certain symmetries. Because 
because we believe that fundamentally the universe is this its overall properties are the same at any point in time. The properties of the universe are the same properties. That's the thing. We can ask what the fundamental constants are actually changing in time. But the degree to which we believe it or not, this is related to time translation invariance. Overall, I mean, of course, we can have local variations, but overall, the laws of physics we assume are the same no matter what point in time we're at. Momentum is conserved because of spatial translation variance. That is, the laws of the universe are the same at any point in any place in the universe. And angular momentum is about rotational invariance. The universe is at some level as a trough. So what this says is that each one of these Symmetries is associated with a conserved quantity. These symmetries themselves are groups of transformations on space and time. And the generators that generate those transformations, what I mean by a generator, I'll explain in a moment, are the energy, the momentum, the angular momentum. So the connection here to the quantum theory is about the generators of symmetries and the symmetries themselves. continuous kind of differentiable set. I'll just loosely say that. Differentiable. Like points on the line through addition. So how are we going to connect this to quantum mechanics? Excuse me, Steve, I'm going to scoot by in here. So 
the elements of our group are going to be functional? Um, no, what we're going to do in a moment is what, let me explain. There are elements are. So, Dean Wigner talked about the theory of symmetries in quantum mechanics. We're going to talk about this in great detail, some not in detail, next semester. But let me just begin this. So, what this is in quantum mechanics, we represent the group by unitary attribute or anti unitary. We haven't described anti unitary, but we'll get to them. They play a minor role. Operators. What do I mean by that? Well, what it says is that I can, for every element in the group, I associate a unitary operator depending on that element. And this is a representation of the group. If um, the operator composition of the two is this that. Okay. So this is what we call a group representation. So the elements of the group are unitary operators now. And every thing that was in G is now a U depending on that. Okay? And so, for example, the U for the identity operator is just not unit for lambda equals one, it's just the identity operator. And U of the inverse is the inverse unitary which is the adverb. So this is a representation of the group. Yeah? Can you always make a unitary representation or does that only apply to specific? No, you can always do that if they're groups. Exactly. You can always represent them by matrices, but not unitaries. Yep. All right. So. Um, now, if it's a Lie group and there's this notion of differential continuity, we could have what we call near identity. Okay, so this is the identity. I'm going to have something that's close to the identity in the sense of I go a differential distance away from it or a small distance away from it. Okay, so um, let's say I have some unitary, which is the identity involved or, or composed with some small epsilon is in some sense small, close to the identity. This is equal to, I claim, the identity operator plus that epsilon times an anti-hermitian operator. How do I prove that? So this is, let's say this is the group under addition. that the composition law works, and we have to prove that uh, the inverse is the adjoint. Okay? So, let's do the composition between two of these. Well, 
Well, that's <coughs> trivia. That works. This is u at the thing that's close to that sum. That's fine. The composition law obviously works because there's addition. The inverse, according to the addition law, would be minus epsilon. So that's equal to 1 minus epsilon a. But a is anti-hermitian. So minus a is a dagger. So this is equal to that, which it must be. So this is a way of representing uh, the elements of the group near the identity. And this A is known as the generator of the group. Now there may be, if I don't have a one parameter group, if I have a mode parameter, then I'll have more than one. This would generally be a vector, and I have a vector of possible generators. But for the moment, let's talk about a one parameter group, like translation in time, or translation along one direction in space. OK? Now, by convention, we write A as minus i times a hermitian operator. So that the near unitary, or a near identity, something about this connect to physics. Let's talk about in the last two minutes and then I'll quit. Time translation. So we want to translate the system in time from some initial time to some later time, OK? And uh, those time translations are parameterized by all the times along the real line, OK? So we would say that the group here is defined by a unitary operator parameterized by that element of the group, where I'm going to fix the initial time. That would just be some agreed to. Okay. This is my time translation operator. Let's talk about the, the near unitary. I'm sorry, near identity. So let's say that we go just a differential time away from T0. Okay, so this is near identity. If I didn't do anything, if I didn't translate by any amount, this would be the identity operator. But I'm translating by a tiny amount. This, according to this, is the identity operator minus i 
times something which I'm going to call omega dt. Why am I calling it omega? Because this has the units of times the minus one. It's a Hermitian operator. It has to be. Now, what is that operator? Well, according to Noether's theorem, the generator of time translation is the thing that's conserved. And what is that? Energy. So that means that this operator has to be proportional to energy. And that energy operator is an operator we call the Hamiltonian. So there's some constant here. It has to be that. So that this thing, so alpha has the dimensions of energy uh, or alpha has the dimensions of the dimensions of alpha are equal to one over energy times time. This, this has units of one over time, and this has to can cancel transmutants. Okay? This thing, energy times time, is in classical physics what we call action. Now what that constant is, is not given derivable. It's just given by nature. Can anyone guess what that unit of action is? Planck's constant? Yeah, Planck's constant. Hooray, we finally get h bar. Wait, shouldn't it be h if it's not 2 pi? No, it's h bar. That's the constant that appears here. It's the constant which allows us to translate the physical quantities of energy and time into Hilbert space units. And so we have that the, the is the identity minus i over h bar times the Hamiltonian d. And we have finally written down the Schrodinger equation. And we will continue with this next time. Symmetries, conservation laws. That's the hook.